Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, third in the series of uh, roundtable discussions that we are presenting uh, on the crisis uh, in Ukraine and it's a spillover now into the international arena uh, as well. Uh, we began a few weeks ago with our first session sponsored by the Ukrainian Research Institute uh, called it, Why Was Kiev Burning? when it still seemed to be an internal uh, affair of the Ukrainian state. Uh, that uh, became uh, very quickly uh, an obsolete uh, 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 issue and when Russia entered the scene we have been conducting a joint uh, series with the Davis Center. Uh, last Monday, we had one on the problems of economics and politics connected with the uh, Ukrainian-Russian problem and especially the, well, invasion of Crimea by Russia. And today we will be turning to uh, what is now the epicenter uh, of the conflict, uh, the Crimean Peninsula, uh, the area in which the conflict now is assuming its most critical form and about which I believe the least is known, at least in the general public. So we want to devote uh, this session to uh, the uh, to Crimea, its history, its peoples, and the impact that this may have, the domestic situation in Crimea, on the international uh, arena as well. Uh, I will introduce the speakers in the order in which they will be speaking. Uh, first, we will have Kelly O'Neill, who is Associate uh, Professor of History here at Harvard, and her specialization uh, is the history of the Russian Empire uh, prior to uh, the revolution, prior to 1917, and she's particularly interested in the methods and meanings of imperial rule in the southern borderlands in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Uh, the politics of architectural space and Russian, Ottoman encounters in the Black Sea uh, region. Uh, so she is very well equipped to present to us the pre-Soviet uh, history uh, of Crimea and its uh, people. Uh, next will be Professor uh, Terry Martin, who is George F. Baker III, Professor of Russian Studies and Director of the Davis uh, Center here at Harvard. Uh, he is a specialist on uh, the Soviet Union and author of the classic book on uh, the nationalities aspect of uh, Soviet history, The Affirmative Action Empire, Nations and Th Nationalism in the USSR, 1923 to 1939. Uh, he also co-edited with uh, Ronald Suni, uh, A State of Nations, Empire, and Nation Making in the Land of Lenin and Stalin. And again, someone uh, who can give us the background of the Soviet uh, prelude to what is happening today. And uh, in the, uh, the next in the sequence of speakers is Oksana Shevel, uh, Associate Professor of Political Science at Tufts University. She is also a center associate at Davis Center and an associate of the Ukrainian Research Institute. Uh, she, uh, her research and teaching focuses on the post-Soviet region uh, surrounding Russia and issues such as nation, nation building, state building, politics of citizenship, uh, migration, memory, historical memory politics, and uh, international institutions and democratization. She will speak to us on uh, the experience of Crimea in the 20 odd years of independent Ukraine. Uh, I will bring up the rear, uh, my basic function will be perhaps to uh, provide some footnotes to what will have been said by my colleagues, perhaps occas occasionally add uh, a filler here or there, and also I will uh, address a few words about the uh, <clears throat> demographic situation, which I think has been overlooked, but which uh, has very grave implications for what is going on and what may happen um, in, the in the future. So with no more ado, let me turn the floor over to Professor Kelly O'Neill. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the last few weeks have been a rather surreal experience for me, for someone who has spent um, 
I don't know, I had, I've lost count of how many years um, studying and researching this part of the world, this particular part of the world, which to me has always felt like a very, um, that I've been cultivating a very, you know, intimate kind of knowledge with a place that, with which not many people are terribly well acquainted. I reminded my students this morning of the, um, the the kind of the true the the saying that's that floats around in, in popular culture that that war is God's way of teaching the American public geography, um, and I feel like this is you know it's also um, God's way of of teaching the American media uh, Russian history, um, and so that's what uh, we're contending with in in many ways here today. On Monday at um, the the previous panel on the crisis in Ukraine, my colleague Sergei Plochi, um Kind of used his his referenced his status as an historian to kind of defend himself against anyone who would want him to make predictions about the future. Right, that's not the the business of historians. Um, and I too want to invoke my my credentials as an historian. In this particular setting, I'm I'm less worried that I'd be asked to make predictions about the future. But I am I do have a certain anxiety, and that is. Um, has to do with the ways in which the past is used to, to justify and not just to understand the present. And so I've given some careful thought to what kind of history I wanted to talk about in the 10 minutes allotted to me today. Um, the history of any place is complex and multifaceted. It's rarely linear, linear and never inevitable. All of that is true of Crimea. There's no one story to tell. Um, and no one single narrative that I would want you to, to come away with today. So I'm, I'm not going to march through the centuries, the, the history of, of you know, centuries of Russian rule um, in Crimea or the millennia of Crimean history itself. What instead I want to do is just make three points, and then we can kind of pick them apart and expand upon them in the, the question uh, and answer the discussion section uh, later. Um, and the three points that I want to make very briefly are, are these. One, that Crimea has always been a source of either active or potential destabilizing forces from the Russian point of view. And I should say that the three points that I've chosen to share with you address the Russian point of view, the Russian understanding of Crimea, not because I think that's the only story to tell, but because I think that's a terribly important one to address right now. The second point is that Crimea has always been, although here the always refers to a slightly shorter chronology, uh, the chronology of the last 231 years uh, since Catherine II, Empress of Russia, annexed Crimea in April of 1793. Um, it, Crimea has always been a site of sustained ideological investment on the part of the Russian government that it has been a productive site for exploring the meaning and implications of Russianness, of what it means to be Russian, as well as the identity, the territorial identity, but other ways of thinking about identity of the Russian state. Um, and my third point, in a sense, builds on those two. And it is this, that Crimea's significance from the point of view of Moscow or St. Petersburg um, has always been constructed on two levels simultaneously that Crimea has always been a crucial waypoint, right? A, thinking about Crimea has always been a way of addressing broader spaces of geopolitical concern, economic concern, cultural ideas. Um, accessing the spaces of, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about what those spaces were, but it has also always been a very particular concern, a very localized uh, concern of Russia. When all of the external kind of broader implications of what Crimea might give access to are stripped away, Crimea has very distinct and compelling meaning in the minds of government officials and, and private uh, citizens within Russia, that, it, that this is historically something um, that one can say. So those are the three points that I want to make. And um, as an historian, I wish I could hold you here for three hours while I you know, unroll all of my copious evidence for, for these points, but I won't. So I'm going to you know, select just a bit, a shred or two of evidence for, for each of these points and see, and hopefully they will provide a springboard for what my colleagues will be saying um, in the rest of, of this session. So first, the idea that Crimea has always been a source of actual, active, or potential, or imagined destabilizing forces. Um, 
Now, this has been the case, um, I would say, for, for three reasons, that the, the destabilizing potential of Crimea has been associated with three things. The first is the, the fact that Crimea was located and, in fact, in many ways defined the wild steppe, the wild southern frontier of, of Muscovy and, and Russia in the 18th century, that this was a source of, of slave raiding. Of, of nomadic and semi-nomadic peoples who would come charging across the Great Steppe and take captive hundreds, thousands, in, in, in a given year as many as tens of thousands of, of Slavic um, agriculturalists and, and taxpayers for, for Muscovy. This was an incredibly important destabilizing uh, force uh, for in the in the early you know in the years when the Russian Empire was was coming into an existence, and this was a source of deep concern. Um, for uh, the czars in Moscow, and they were determined to put an end to this, and their determination to put an end to the slave raiding that was perpetuated by the, the, the Tatar peoples and the Nugai people of the steppe for reasons of their own, um, but that linked uh, the economy and the productive potential of Russia to the slave markets of, of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, again, these kind of broad spaces. The desire to put an end to this was a motivating factor in the, um, the kind of geopolitical strategy of Tsar um, Ivan Alexeyevich and Peter the Great and, and his successors. Um, there are a series of attempts to stop this, to put an end to this, to secure the southern frontier. Um, and it was not, although there were lots of attempts at it, one could argue that the, secure, the security, the destabilizing potential of Crimea in this sense um, wasn't ended until Catherine annexes uh, the Crimean um, Khanate in 1783. The second source, or imagined or real destabilizing potential of Crimea has to do with its identity as, as an Islamic space, as a place where the predominant majority of the population was Muslim for, most, uh, for a good chunk of its history. Um, this identity, this Muslim identity of Crimea, um, this was destabilizing in any number of ways although it was not necessarily, and by definition, destabilizing for the Russian imperial project. But the identity of Crimea's Tatar population as Muslim reinforced the sense that, that Crimea, the place and its people, was part of the Ottoman world. In this way, the Ottomans were essentially enemy number one for the, the Tsarist state uh, from the 18th century through uh, the, the end of the 19th century. This was the enemy against whom they fought the majority of their wars and directed a great deal of energy and resources against uh, asserting themselves against the Ottoman, um, the, the, the port. This, uh, now, is the, 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 another piece of this, the story of Islam, um, has to do with the fact that uh, this was a world, for Islam from the point of Russian officials, um, occasionally had a politicized or radicalized element. And in this case, Crimea was not the, the, the kind of hotbed of um, Islamic fundamentalism or politicized Islam in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but Crimea had deep and meaningful social and cultural connections with the Caucasus. And so whether or not there were reasons that, that we would consider to be um, substantial, Russian officials, governors in, uh, during the imperial period were simply terrified by the idea that, uh, that political Islam would make its way to Crimea from the Caucasus, infiltrate this, this wonderfully idyllic and peaceful part of the empire, and ruin the imperial project there by mobilizing the local Muslim population. And there were, there were just enough little episodes uh, where this kind of thing almost happened to justify the anxieties and the paranoias of Russian officials. Um, connected with this too, again, this is all kind of from the point of view of, of the, the, you know, the Russian czar state looking at Crimea. The, other, the third way in which Crimea was potentially a destabilizing force was that it was the, um, the, the, a place in which one found unreliable subjects. And this is perhaps the worst thing of all from the point of view of, of an empire that, above all, thirsts after stability and order. And if you have people, if you have subjects upon whom you cannot rely, um, this is terribly problematic. 
the extent to which this was really a concern of, of the Russian government is manifested in all sorts of ways over time. You could simply look at the fact that um, no lesser figure than Grigory Pachomkin himself, the so-called Viceroy of the South, uh, Catherine's right-hand man for, for much of her reign, was the one who individually presided over the swearing of the oath of allegiance of Crimean elites in the aftermath of annexation, that it took the power of his person to kind of cement a, a kind of relationship between this part of the world, the, these new inhabitants and their new imperial um, government. The fear, of, the fear of what Crimean Tatars might do um, drove a, a fear of, of collaboration with the Ottomans uh, in the late 18th century, in the 19th century. It drove fears of collaboration that the Tatars would collaborate with the, the French, uh, with the British in the Crimean War. And these fears then led to whether or not they actually manifested in um, widespread evidence that the Crimean Tatars were really a source of, of instability and unreliability, um, imperial policies often were a bit proactive. Um, a little bit of evidence of unreliability could lead to the forced resettlement of massive proportions of the Crimean Tatar population. So in the wake of the Crimean War, um, roughly 200,000 of the 300,000 Crimean Tatars who remained in Crimea um, were essentially maybe voluntarily, but mostly coercively, were removed from Crimea, a massive demographic remaking of Crimea. Um, and so what I hope becomes clear from this is that while Crimea, maybe from the point of view of Russia, has been the site of potential destabilization, Russia has always been a destabilizing force for Crimea as well, right? And I think that that's important to bear in mind. So just really briefly, my other two points, that Crimea has always been um, a site of sustained ideological investment and um, a productive site for exploring the meaning of Russianness. There are all different ways that one can, can make this point. Let me just reference a few things and we can get into them more if we want to. The evidence I see for this, the kinds of pieces of evidence I see for this, is that the Russians engaged in a, a willful reimagining of space in Crimea, which is really, really fascinating. They reimagined Crimea they recreated it. They took it from a place of, of a wild step to a land of plenty. And sometimes it would appear as a land of plenty in ideological imaginings of this space, but sometimes it would also, it wouldn't be wild or plentiful, it would simply be empty, a blank slate upon which Russian officials could create anything they wanted to. And what they wanted to create was an idealized form of, of Russian-ness. So you have governors in the late 18th century who would, would write, um, if you can, paint yourself a picture of the open space of Perikop to the Salgir River, spreading over a hundred versts, surrounded on the western side by the Black Sea, to the northeast by the Sivash and Azov Seas. Sometime in the future, this vast plain will be filled with villages, embellished with churches, palaces, and other buildings, and all around them will be gardens. And those gardens, of course, will be filled not with birch trees and oak trees that you might find in the Russian heartland, but with olives and citrus and all of the wonderful kind of fruits of, of this, this idealized land. Crimea was reimagined toponomically. It was renamed, and we can get into the meanings behind that. And Russians also engaged in a willful reimagining of history. The idea that Crimea has been Russian from time immemorial from the late 10th century when Prince Vladimir of Kiev was baptized on the Black Sea coast. Um, I happen to think that if Russians wanted to make a really robust and compelling argument for um, why they have a claim to Crimea, it wouldn't be the argument that Crimea has always been Russian. I think they would be better off, in fact, um, talking about the enormous investment that Rus the Russian government has made in making Crimea Russian, that they've invested a lot in this over time. Um, a process that has unfolded over roughly a century um, from the annexation onward. Um, and there are all kinds of ways we can talk about the form that that investment has taken. And finally, the idea that Crimea's significance from the point of view of Moscow or St. Petersburg has always been constructed on two levels, right? It's always operating on both a very kind of personalist, intimate, micro level. But Crimea has also had um, this rather, you know, transnational or global significance from the point of view of Russia, um, that this is a, a waypoint for understanding Russia's place in, in the world, that Crimea is the place that has been associated that that was part of the Ottoman world 
It's part of the world of Islam. It's part of the world of Greek civilization from the days of you know, Greek settlement in the sixth century BCE. Um, that it is part of, so it is part of that kind of Western civilizational inheritance. Crimea is associated with Eur the Eurasian steppe with the great Mongol legacy and all of that that entails. So acquiring Crimea is part of acquiring the legacy of a massive imperial project from the early modern period. And beyond that, of course, there are all the entanglements that Crimea um, you know, serves as waypoint for, entanglements with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, with the Cossack Hetmanate, um, and with, with other Western powers that, that are kind of brought in by extension um, over time. But it's, I think, the particular meaning of Crimea that is perhaps the most important and perhaps the best way of understanding Putin's policies and Russians, Russia's policies now in Crimea. The fact that this has always been a place of personal importance, of personal significance for men of power in Russia. This is the place where they built their imperial palaces, their pleasure homes, the provincial nests, that glittering emerald necklace of, of of palatial homes surrounded by art orchards and gardens and terraced landscapes leading down to a sparkling black sea. Um, that this was a place of health, of civilization, of prestige, of power, a retreat from all the bad things about the rest of Russian space, but a place that still somehow embodied um, Russian space. And I think that there is something very meaningful in that, in perhaps a kind of a psychology, a historical psychology, which is not my ballywick, but, but I think that there is, there is something there to consider. So with those three points, I'll, I'll leave it there. First one. So, um, uh, unlike <coughs> Kelly, who has a um, forthcoming book on Crimea, I am uh, the non-expert on Crimea on this panel. Um, I, uh, as Luko said, uh, studied so Soviet management of ethnicity, uh, and so I'll, uh, um, I will uh, address the question from the perspective of the Slavic population of Crimea, uh, and also with some comparison to the Slavic uh, population. And how do I move it down? I just Tip the down arrow. Um, oh, that one. Um, uh, uh, in Crimea and in um, southern and eastern Ukraine, since obviously our concern right now is uh, the possible spread of this. Uh, and unlike uh, Kelly, who made uh, three points elegantly, I will make, uh, uh, and authoritatively, I'll make one point uh, that's somewhat more hypothetical. So my uh, one point is that Crimean attitudes uh, differ quite radically from those in uh, southern and eastern Ukraine, even though those three regions are part of the historical territory called Nova Russia that was conquered in 1774 and 1783 um, for, uh, and incorporated into the Russian uh, Empire. And the hypothetical is that this is due to the formative experience uh, of the 33 years in which um, Crimea was administratively separated from uh, southern and eastern Ukraine uh, and was part of the uh, Russian Federal Republic and not the Ukrainian Federal Republic from 1921 uh, to 1954. Of those 33 years, uh, 23 of them, uh, Crimea was an autonomous republic uh, named after the Crimean Tatar population, uh, and only for eight and a half years uh, was it a Russian province, uh, uh, oblast, after the Crimean Tatars uh, were deported in 1944. Uh, they was renamed in 1945, simply as an oblast of the Russian Federation, uh, and uh, until 1954, when it was transferred uh, to Ukraine. So a very short period of time, and thus administratively, as well as uh, in other uh, uh, aspects, uh, it was not the age-old immemorial uh, Russian space, uh, and it wasn't a space that was administratively cut off from Nikolaev, uh, Odessa, Luhansk, Donetsk, and these other areas that are of concern to us uh, now. Um, but it was mythologically cut off, and I was going to ask Kelly to, to explain this, but she kindly did it ahead of time. Um, uh, so I, 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 I won't go into that aspect. 
So I want to, uh, uh, to discuss what that formative experience was and why I think it shaped somewhat uh, some attitudes today. So I just took, and this is such an irony that I'm using P P PowerPoint and Kelly isn't. It's like <laughs> the first time I ever used PowerPoint and Kelly is our digital specialist. Um, so I in any case, I took these four slides from a blog post from the Monkey Cage, which is a uh, disciplinary political science blog that has been covering Ukraine very uh, uh, intensively, and I would recommend to anyone. Oksana uh, has a post there. Several of our Hury, um associates have posted um, there. So uh, this was a uh, survey that was carried out by a Princeton and a, a University of North Carolina uh, political scientists uh, before the conflict, but in early 2013, so it's quite current. Um, so they, first of all, they ask, uh, what is your homeland? Uh, Crimea, the east and the south, which is the Nova Russia center around Kiev and west in the Galician uh, region. Uh, and as you can see, the four non-Crimean regions, and you get this on voting patterns on almost anything, there's a small, there's a gradation, um, but there's no clear breaking point between west and east. Well, that's not our topic for here, but I just wanted to make that point. The clear breaking point is with Crimea, and there you see quite a different uh, outlook. So on the question of uh, what is your homeland? Uh, about 70% of the people in the west, uh, I mean in the east and the south, uh, other parts of the historical Nova Russia uh, think of it Ukraine, only 35% um, in Crimea. One would have thought one would get large numbers of Crimeans who thought of either the Soviet Union or Russia uh, as their uh, homeland. But oddly enough, uh, you get uh, less uh, than in uh, uh, the east and the south, and even less than in uh, central Ukraine. Uh, whereas you get this huge anomaly here, uh, your uh, own region uh, for Crimea, which is not the case for anywhere else. Uh, so that's the slide that most interests me. Uh, just give these two as well. This with geopolitical uh, uh, orientation, whether it is on Russia, uh, the EU, or that. Uh, the main point here is that you get a dramatic uh, orientation towards Russia uh, in Crimea. So they don't think they're part of Russia or the Soviet Union, but they think that they should be oriented on. Um, the difference not as dramatic uh, as in the other cases, but nevertheless there. A lot of this is explained by ethnicity. That is, Ukrainians represent a very small part, uh, ethnic part of um, uh, Crimea. And contrary to what you might sort of get from reading the news, they represent a very large part of eastern uh, and uh, southern Ukraine. But here you have to keep in mind that the causation can run both ways. That is, that there is a, uh, it can be that there's a Russian orientation because there's a low Ukrainian ethnic uh, uh, community. But there can also be, because ethnicity has chosen, the fact that there's a low Ukrainian ethnic community because there's an orientation on Russia, if you get what I mean. Um, and then a bit of data on language. And my last slide, uh, Russian is a state language. And uh, um, you see uh, Crimea overwhelmingly uh, in favor of it. And again, a gradation as you move out. So I am just going to go back to the first one, and then I will leave those alone, because that's the one that uh, strikes me uh, as interesting. So uh, what happened from 1921 to 1954? that was important in uh, forming the political attitudes in um, Nova Russia on the uh, Ukrainian and the Crimean side of the uh, uh, border that was emerged. So in 1921, the Tatar Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic uh, is formed after Crimea is conquered finally from the whites. A uh, Ukrainian uh, Soviet Socialist Republic has already been formed. Why isn't Crimea put in the republic at that point? Um, it's not something I've actually researched, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, geopolitical factors that Kelly talked about are certainly uh, part of it, uh, as well as the mythological factors, but also the factor that in 1921, uh, Ukraine had no autonomous regions. They later formed a Moldovan region, uh, all, and uh, that Central Asia didn't yet exist. They were all autonomous regions of Russia. Russia was essentially the grab bag in which all of the uh, autonomous uh, regions were put. So once you formed a Crimean autonomous region, it was logical that it would get put into the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic, uh, as it was uh, then called and called until 1991. 
Um, so a division is made between Crimea, which becomes part of the RSFSR in 1921, uh, and Ukraine. So why was this crucial? Here I'm going to borrow um, uh, uh, from the work of Keith Darden, who is a, uh, uh, trained as a political scientist here and is a political scientist at American University and has done some very interesting recent work uh, showing the crucial role for understanding contemporary political attitudes on the time in which um, uh, different peoples and different regions uh, first had mass universal education and what the ideology uh, was taught to them in schools. So if you look at this, you can explain an astonishing amount of the voting patterns in the first communist elections across Eastern Europe and all of Eurasia. Uh, he also shows that you can explain the pattern of resistance or collaboration with the Nazis and the Soviets in World War II uh, and in the aftermath. The argument is that, what, uh, that people are malleable when the first uh, episode of universal mass education comes, uh, but once they've uh, uh, adopted political identities, they become much less malleable. Um, so, Nova Russia, Luhansk, Donetsk, Crimean, etc., were kind of around what he would, what Darden says around 50% is his kind of breaking point for when you start to get into what he'll call mass universal education. Some people were over 50%, most were below, but they go to 100% in the 1920s and 1930s. What are the people taught in Luhansk, Donetsk, uh, Nipopetrovsk, and the other regions that we hope will not become part of the current um, uh, conflict? They were taught that they belong to a territorial Ukrainian polity of which they were members, whether they were Ukrainian or Russian. If they were ethnically Ukrainian, if they or their parents had taught Ukrainian, they were taught that they were ethnic Ukrainians. And they were taught that Ukraine was in a permanent friendship with Russia. Uh, uh, and so they were taught that they were territorially Ukrainian, but with a Russophilic orientation. Um, there were about 8 million Ukrainians, ethnically defined by the 1926 census that lived across the border from Ukraine in the RSFSR, in Voronezh, Kursk, and Kuban. Um, they were not taught this. And by the 1939 census, uh, only about 2 million of them thought of themselves as Ukrainian, and now virtually none do. Um, in, 19, uh, in World War II, uh, there was a uh, German uh, ethnographer who was in Taganrog, just across the Ukrainian border. Uh, and he was interviewing some ethnic Ukrainians there. Uh, and he asked them if they were, what their ethnicity was, and they said they were Russians. And they said, but you speak Ukrainian, uh, the same language that they speak over there in, in Ukraine. And they said, oh, yes, they're our brothers. Uh, so they were in some kind of affiliation, but they thought of themselves as Russian. They had taken that message. The people in Ukraine thought of themselves as Ukrainians. In Crimea, on the other hand, they were taught that they were part of the Crimean Autonomous uh, Republic. Uh, if they were Crimean Tatars, only 25% of the population, uh, they were, of course, taught that their ethnicity was Crimean uh, 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 Tatar. Um, so they were taught that that was their uh, uh, homeland. They were taught that they were part of the RSFSR, whatever that was, which had a, uh, you know, a very vague uh, kind of uh, grab bag understanding. Uh, and that was uh, uh, the message until 1944, uh, when the Crimean Tatars were uh, deported as part of the uh, uh, punishment of various peoples accused of um, um, cooperating with the Nazis. And this fits into, of course, the security concerns uh, that Kelly mentioned. Only for nine years, then, uh, were um, uh, Crimean uh, Slavs uh, a Russian oblast of a Russian republic. It's really the only nine years uh, prior to this March 16th uh, when, they, uh, uh, when they were really part of Russia as opposed to a Russian empire of which the rest of Ukraine was also um, uh, part of. Uh, and then in 1954, they were um, uh, transferred uh, to Ukraine. Um, what impact that had is harder for me to say. I haven't studied it. It is interesting to me that in 1939, 13.7% of Ukraine 
of Crimeans identified as Ukrainian and 49.6% identified as Russians. So about almost four times as many Russians as Ukrainians. By 1989, it's 25.6% Ukrainian, 69 Russians. So actually, the Ukrainian percentage has grown. It may well be that being transferred to the Ukrainian uh, SSSR uh, prevented assimilation to a Russian identity uh, amongst the Ukrainian minority, though I put that as speculation. So um, basically, uh, the argument here that I've been trying to develop is that those key years played a role in this graph that you see uh, here, uh, and in the fact that despite the fact that the Russian language is spoken to an uh, enormous degree uh, in um, eastern uh, southern Ukraine and that there's a Russian orientation, you have a much stronger sense of Ukrainian homeland uh, in those regions uh, and a much weaker sense in Crimea and a much stronger sense of a, uh, a distinctively uh, Crimean identity. Uh, this should theoretically mean that it will be harder for the Russians to uh, 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 develop a kind of a irredente within uh, the eastern and the southern Ukrainian uh, regions uh, than it was uh, in Crimea, though that may not be entirely relevant if it's armies that uh, cross the border. Thank you. This little exchange between Oksana and me uh, concerned that we will now have a, a sort of a 50-year gap between where Terry left off and where uh, Oksana will pick up. But uh, in my filler, uh, as I mentioned, I will do, and my footnotes, I will try to bridge that gap a little bit. Uh, but okay. Oksana, please. Yes, thank you. Yes, so I'll be focusing um, on the post-Soviet period and, um, you know, as I was saying, like, w what about between 54 and 91, but Kupko will talk about that. Um, okay, so um, so as a political scientist, I wanted to uh, focus my remarks um, on the political situation um, in Crimea in the 1991, uh, from 91 kind of to now. And um, I guess the general point I wanted to emphasize, maybe perhaps two points. Uh, first of all, that Crimean politics has been a total mess domestically, and that actually has been somewhat of a saving grace and sort of a blessing in disguise for the fact that, uh, that we haven't seen a conflict in Crimea up until now. And I would further say that um, this domestic politics in Crimea has not actually changed that dramatically from um, the early 90s until now, and what really has changed is the position of Russia. Um, and um, if Russian sort of, in a way, again, if you want to put a positive spin, I've been in the um, mood lately of trying to put a positive spin on things. My colleague Maria Popova and I just published an article in Foreign Policy where we are arguing that not all is lost for Ukraine's democratic future. Um, but anyways, so um, I guess my point would be that um, if somehow mysteriously through international mediation or witchcraft or what have you, Russians were actually to leave, um, you know, there is a quite high probability that Ukrainian and Crimean elites will be able to find negotiated settlement. Um, it, it may take time, it may be messy, just like they did in the 1990s. So I'm going to talk a little bit about domestic politics there and also especially emphasize the role of the Crimean Tatars, which would be yet another dimension on which Crimea is quite unique. Um, you know, Terry was already talking about the uniqueness of Crimea um, in the identity there, and I would further add that the presence of Crimean Tatars make Crimea also quite unique uh, from other regions of Ukraine um, where there are Russian-speaking majorities and um, strong kind of sentiment toward uh, greater ties um, with Russia. So, um, okay, so um, so let me develop these points briefly, and then again, um, you know, obviously I won't be able to cover everything, but I'm happy to go into some more details during question and answer. Um, so in Crimea, which um, after it was transferred um, to Ukraine uh, by Khrushchev, by the way, uh, I probably Lubko will talk about it, um, but um, the, there have been economic rationale for this transfer. So it wasn't just sort of a symbolic gift um, of Khrushchev uh, to Ukraine. But if we look at the economics of Crimea, and uh, now there is some information about it, um, even in Western media, Crimea is very dependent on mainland Ukraine for things such as water, electricity, um, g gas supplies, and so forth. So as far as kind of managing the peninsula economically, it actually made quite a lot of sense at the time. And I think some of the rationale even then has been that, you know, to revive Crimean economy, which was quite a depressed region after the Second World War, it would actually be easier if it was administered uh, from Ukraine. So um, there has been not much sort of politically going on up until um, the late uh, Gorbachev period, um, when was the start of Perestroika and sort of this revival or um, the development of um, kind of 
pro-Ukrainian and subsequently separatist sentiment um, in Ukraine, um, the, the movement began, began in Crimea to kind of try to counter, or at least, um, you know, concerns have been um, developed that if Crimea uh, ends up being part of Ukraine, what would it mean for local population there, concerns over Ukrainianization and things like this. So we see um, already um, in September um, 1990, the local Soviet, the Crimean Soviet, um, decides that it wants to return Crimea the status of autonomy. So again, against being an oblast, Crimea um, local um, legislation there decides uh, that they want to regain the status of the autonomy. A referendum has been conducted um, on that question in January 1991, where it was supported. Um, Ukrainian parliament subsequently inserted sort of another clause in that referendum, um, saying that um, Crimea would, um, be, would have um, the status of autonomy, but within Ukraine and also subject to union treaties. So it was quite messy language, but there was certainly this um, quite um, you know, growing concern um, on the part of Russian speaking populations in Crimea, that if Crimea ends up uh, in independent Ukraine, so there could be um, you know, consequences, especially the spheres of um, so-called forced uh, Ukrainianization. Um, right? um, so uh, the, um, 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 and then sort of this is where Crimean politics starts getting interesting because even though there has been this quite um, widely shared sentiment uh, that, you know, the, being part of Ukraine may not be all that great and being sort of closer to Russia or with Russia uh, is better, but the pro-Russian groups in Crimea have historically been from, you know, again from the early 1990s, very much in conflict with each other. So which is somewhat paradoxical. So on the one hand, there is this sort of common sentiment that this is where Crimean identity is on the part of many in the population, and this is where, um, you know, generally speaking, um, the region may want to go. But um, somehow, and again, this, um, I'm not going to go into too many details. Some of it had to do with the personalities um, of the people who were involved in this pro-Russian movement, people such as Mishkov, uh, who became, um, you know, president of Crimea at one time, has been actually deported from Ukraine and now apparently has come back. To the current leaders of the pro-Russian movement, this person um, um, who was elected um, the uh, chairman, um, the, the prime minister of Crimea, uh, has a nickname of Goblin. He was a criminal authority in the 1990s, apparently made his fortune by uh, running the porta potties um, somewhere near Crimean beaches. And essentially, uh, sort, of this, sort of the kind of criminal atmosphere that existed in this uh, wild market um, period of the early 90s, so a lot of the local elites who have developed and subsequently became sort of leaders of these pro-Russian forces, um, they're really quite unsavory characters. Um, and again, I'm not saying this is makes Crimea unique, but they have managed um, to spend as much time literally fighting among each other as they have been uh, fighting with kind of say pro-Ukrainian forces or you know central government um, in Ukraine. And that really has been quite sort of a saving grace um, as far as uh, Crimea and Ukraine being able to find eventually a negotiated solution and this pro-Russian sentiment being um, subverted not even so much by the actions of the central Ukrainian government, but by, by, by the infighting among the local Crimean pro-Russian elites. And sort of it's no, no, no more obvious was this um, situation as in 1994, after um, in, in, the, in an election, um, the post of Crimean presidency was established and Yuri Mishkov became the president of Crimea on this platform of kind of essentially breaking away uh, from Ukraine. And there was also pro-Russian majority in the Crimean parliament. So at that point in time, people who studied Crimea, you know, almost believed that Crimea is essentially lost for Ukraine because there was this great, uh, you know, political majority both in the, in the local legislation and the post of the presidency. But literally within months, they were already fighting with each other. Eventually the parliament um, they dismissed Mishkov um, and subsequently, you know, when Kiev moved moved in and canceled the constitution and introduced direct presidential rule for a few months, um, they were able to do it again because of the disarray um, among the pro-Russian um, forces um, and, um, and groups in Crimea. So what essentially happens, and this is sort of where, you know, Crimea entered the period of stability in the 2000s, that by the end of the 1990s, Ukrainian and Crimean elites were able to negotiate um, a constitution um, that delineated powers between Crimea um, and um, and Ukrainian government. So this process began in 1995, again, after Mishkov, sort of this pro-Russian uh, forces imploded and Mishkov was dismissed from the post of the presidency, the post of presidency was abolished. And then between 1995 and late 1998, Ukrainian Crimean elites went through many iterations um, of drafting the constitution that delineated the powers between Crimea and Ukraine. And again, uh, if anybody is interested in details, there is a whole book about written about it by Gwendolyn Sasse, who teaches, um, I forget now which university in Britain, but um, you know, she kind of went through this whole um, 
you know, back and forth of these negotiations. And her argument, or one of her arguments, is that the very process of negotiations was stabilizing, even though sort of the details were very messy, but just this idea that the elites were able to go back and forth and eventually find a negotiated settlement. Again, it's not a perfect settlement. There were interesting sort of sub-stories in particular. Uh, that leader of Crimean speaker at the time, Leonid Grach, a communist, he apparently agreed, among other things, um, to, to say lower status of the Russian language that was in one of the earlier drafts of the constitution for greater power of the speaker of the Crimean parliament because he was the speaker and he wanted to enjoy this power. So again, even kind of pro-Russian leaders, you know, oftentimes compromised, we can say, sort of ideological or political goals or, you know, pro-Russian goals. Um, in return for greater powers for themselves personally and positions um, and things like this. So, so and again, like this, the situation I would say hasn't changed all that much. So again, if, you know, in the 1990s, because Russia was engaged in the war in Chechnya and really had no appetite to getting involved. And in fact, you know, Yeltsin um, entourage said that, that much to Mishkov that, you know, we support you, but you know, that's ultimately your own business, right? That's really different now. So the fact that if say had Russia had not invaded um, Crimea, um, in the last couple of weeks, and if it was up to Ukrainian leaders and the Crimean leaders to negotiate um, division of powers, perhaps increasing Crimean autonomy, perhaps changing some provisions in the constitution, I would say, and you know, uh, I would guess that people who study Crimean politics probably most would agree with me, it likely would have happened. You know, maybe not immediately, but maybe in the course of some months or years. But cl clearly, a big difference now is this: um, the Russian presence and um, you know the, the role that they play and. So essentially, um, you know, Crimean elites, you know, probably wouldn't be an exaggeration to argue that they're not really even acting autonomously, but they are, you know, in some sense become puppets of, um, you know, whatever wishes they receive and instructions um, from men in green. Um, okay, so now um, let me shift gears a little bit and talk also about the Crimean Tatar factor, which was also very important. And, and again, was the third force sort of between the central government in Ukraine, the pro-Russian, you know, forces in Crimea, and then there has been this Crimean Tatar presence, which also I would say was a contributing factor simultaneously to somewhat instability in the peninsula, uh, but also to the, uh, to the fact that the central government was able to find negotiated solution with the Crimean elites. Um, so again, very briefly, Crimean Tatars, um, you know, as already was mentioned, have been deported uh, by Crimea, um, from Crimea by Stalin in 1944. They have fought for the right to return back to Crimea through um, the Soviet period, and only during Gorbachev they were finally allowed to return. So again, at the same period of time as this sort of pro-Ukrainian separatist sentiment begins to grow in the Ukrainian Republic, and fears about this begin to st stir in Crimea, uh, the massive return of the Crimean Tatars starts in about 1989. So by, by now, again, we don't have, although Lupko will have some more recent statistics, if we, if we go with the census of 2001, which is admittedly quite outdated, um, about 280,000 Crimean Tatars have returned to Crimea, so they account around 12%, probably 12 to 15% of the population, um, arguably higher in the younger age group, right? And um, the Crimean Tatars had this interesting position because they simultaneously were against, very strongly against, uh, kind of Russian influence and Russian rule of Crimea, again, going to their suspicion um, of uh, Russia and the, the memory of the deportation uh, of Stalin. So they have been um, quite reliable pro-Ukrainian force if it came to the conflict between, say, um, more pro-Russian separatist um, sentiments and groups in Crimea and central Ukrainian government. So Crimean Tatars were firmly on the side of Ukrainian government in this conflict. And that support, even though the group is quite small, is not insignificant because, for example, if we look at the outcome even of the independence referendum in December 1991 in Crimea, which was a very narrow vote in favor of independence of Ukraine from the Soviet Union, many have argued, and I think the data certainly supports it, at least kind of correlation-wise, that if, if not for the Crimean Tatars, the vote in Crimea may have well been against independence. So this sort of small percent that shifted the balance over 50% may have well been due to the Crimean uh, Tatar vote. And since then, they cooperated with... Um, various pro-Ukrainian parties, such as Ruch, Ruch, for example, you know, which obviously doesn't have much support uh, given its ideology among the Russian-speaking Crimeans, actually did quite well in the elections in Crimea. And again, that was because the Crimean Tatars as a bloc voted for Ruch. Um, there is something to be said, I'm not gonna mention it now for, you know, to save time. Um, Crimean Tatar movement is not monolithic. Um, there is this Medjlis that commands the majority support of Crimean Tatars, but there are other groups. So if anybody has questions about sort of the internal politics in Crimean Tatar, I can talk about it in Q&A. But um, the, the point that I want to convey, sort of on the one hand, Crimean Tatars were the strongly pro-Ukrainian force. On the other hand, central government of Ukraine was also quite suspicious of Crimean Tatars. And when they didn't need their support, they were actually quite reluctant to, uh, for example, satisfy some of the Crimean Tatar political demands. Um, in particular, Crimean Tatars have long maintained 
that they are an indigenous group as opposed to ethnic minority. And in fact, they even wanted, they kind of moderated this demand over the years, but in early 90s, they made it quite forcefully that they want the status of Crimea to be a national territorial autonomy of Crimean Tatars, to sort of have this region as an autonomous region, um, autonomy of Crimean Tatars, as opposed to just territorial autonomy, which means de facto ethnic Russian autonomy, since Russians are over half percent of the population. Ukrainian government was always wary of this because they understood on the one hand that Russians are not going to like it, and then they also didn't want to invite demands from other ethnic groups sort of as groups for additional claims on the Ukrainian state. Um, they were also quite wary of recognizing Crimean Tatar Medjlis as representative organ of the Crimean Tatars. So again, there has been a lot of kind of back and forth and various compromises were proposed during Kuchma period. Um, and the law on the status of Crimean Tatars as an indigenous group, again, the Tatars have long demanded, still remains unadopted in Ukraine. And it's quite interesting that in the most recent days, the speaker of the Crimean parliament, uh, I think just two days ago, they passed this resolution basically granting Crimean Tatars all these demands that they have been asking for since 1990s, sort of recognizing, um, you know, Medjilis as representative organ and giving them certain quota in the government organs, various government positions and so forth. So now the pro-Russian forces are trying to sway Crimean Tatars on their side because Crimean Tatars say, for example, they'll boycott the referendum, they do not support it. Um, furthermore, Med um, Mustafa Jemilev, who is a leader of the Crimean Tatars, has been flown to Moscow and talked to Putin. Um, and again, Putin sort of, you know, tried to gauge his support for, you know, I I would they support, say, the Russian position now if Russia gives them um, these things that they've been asking for for a long time? And um, I talked to Jamie Lee on the phone about a week ago, um, um, and um, when I also interviewed him in the 90s, I remember he was telling me that in 1990-91, in, in Yeltsin government was making similar propositions with the Crimean Tatars support Russian control of Crimea if Russian government gave them these demands. So they, I mean, it satisfied these political demands that they have for territorial autonomy of Crimean Tatars, status of Medjilis, and things like this. And they have refused this then. They basically don't trust um, the Russian uh, offer. And uh, given the interview uh, Jemilev gave since he came back from Moscow yesterday, it seems like it's the same story, that they don't really trust uh, that these things will happen. But I mean, interestingly, a point here that the Kiev government was in this kind of lucky situation that on the one hand, they could rely on the Crimean Tatars' support when it came to countering pro-Russian separatists in Crimea. On the other hand, when they didn't need them, they also were not willing to give them some of these, these uh, things they've been asking for all these years, because, you know, again, they're kind of suspicious um, and um, see p potential negative implications for inter-ethnic relations, as they said, especially inviting group claims from other ethnic groups, right? So, so I, I think I'll end here um, to save time, but again, sort of my um, general point, um, I think, has been that given the mess Crimean politics has been, um, especially this disarray among the pro-Russian forces and kind of internal fighting within this camp, and the factor, the, the role, political role that the Crimean Tatar presence plays on the peninsula, Ukrainian government has been able to find these negotiated settlements um, uh, through the 1990s, and, um, you know, had it not been for quite, you know, very different role that Russia is playing now relative to what it played in the 1990s, I would say negotiated solution would be possible one time again, um, you know, if and when the Russian forces leave. So I'll end here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oksana, and thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Terry. Uh, it is my turn. I suppose I should say a word or two why I am here. Uh, I have the least qual you know, qualifications to address these issues than uh, my colleagues, but I do have a relationship or a number of re different relationships to uh, Crimea and the issues today. Um, I was in an early incarnation an Ottomanist, a uh, Turkologist, uh, and I studied the 16th, 17th century history of Crimea on the basis of Ottoman Turkish sources. In fact, I taught a course called The Northern Neighbors of the Ottoman Empire. But uh, that sort of defines the door through which I entered the Crimean uh, issue. Uh, also, I was uh, in a very different uh, mode, uh, co-author uh, co and co-editor with Mark Beisinger of uh, a book called The Nationalities Factor in Soviet uh, politics and society, so I also had to deal with the nationalities issue in the late Soviet period. And finally, my first actually published article dealt with demographic, ethnic, ethno-demographic issues. Uh, so these are the three <laughs> different aspects that I will touch on um, in my uh, remarks. Um, and I will be also partly in dialogue with, uh, with my colleagues. Uh, and partly in dialogue with the events that are go uh, happening on the ground uh, today. Uh, 
uh, I'm going to announce also that this is going to be my debut in trying to do a PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And for that, I will ask the assistance of Kostya Bondarenko. And uh, because I do have some uh, visual aids, even audiovisual aids, and I will address the issues as perhaps they appear on uh, the screen, uh, first of all. Well, the general map of uh, Crimea, which uh, simply is uh, to uh, remind you of its shape and place. Uh, what do I do? Is this way sideways or down? Okay. I apologize for this. Now, uh, let me briefly touch on the incorporation of uh, Crimea into Ukraine. There are, I think, three things that have been said uh, by pundits, by journalists, when addressing the Crimean issue over the past perhaps two weeks. They are very fast learners, but perhaps they haven't uh, gone into depth yet. One of them is that Crimea was a gift, a gift by Khrushchev to Ukraine. Uh, why a gift, the nature of the gift, uh, has not been explained. It has become a kind of a mantra, uh, but that it's a somewhat uh, misleading, maybe even dangerous mantra because it implies that there was no rationale, no reason behind it, simply other than to ingratiate uh, oneself, Khrushchev, uh, with the Ukrainian population. Now, in 1954, Khrushchev was not actually the uh, unquestioned leader in the Soviet Union. I don't think that something like transferring a territory the size of Switzerland, which Crimea is, from one republic to the other, uh, was exactly in his power. Uh, he did not consolidate his power until two or three years later. If you think of the anti-party group, uh, it was as late as uh, 1957. I think that both Oksana and at an earlier uh, session, Professor Pluhi, I think at the Kennedy School, uh, pointed to the economic factor, and I think that that is absolutely the crucial one. Crimea is dependent virtually for all of its uh, resources on Ukraine, and it is very difficult to administer it economically without taking that into account. On this map, you see the lines by which uh, gas is uh, transferred to uh, Crimea, it's via Ukraine. And Ukraine supply, the irony is that Ukraine itself is dependent for gas on the Russian Federation, but the Crimea is dependent on Ukraine for 80% of its gas. Uh, I'm sorry, 65% of its gas. 80% of its electricity. Oops, I think I skipped something. Where's the most important one? Water, gas, water. 80% of its water comes from Ukraine. Now, I'm not quite sure how uh, the economics of uh, you know, the, of the market works with, you know, the selling and purchasing of water, potable water and water for irrigation. But I would imagine that uh, if uh, such an essential commodity as gas or oil are subject to purchases and certain prices, then perhaps water is not a commodity that is simply given gratis by one country to another. After all, there are canals, there are pipes to be maintained, and so forth and so on. So it is a rather interesting uh, question what a putative uh, union uh, of Crimea with Russia will mean in the water supplies, not to mention the others. Uh, there are reports that a Russian, uh, or at least the un uh, unidentified soldiers from uh, Crimea are entering into Kherson Oblast, which is just north of the neck connecting Crimea with Ukraine. And I wonder whether it is not perhaps to help secure uh, the unimpeded flow of water and the other uh, resources into Crimea. So to take Crimea may also imply having to ensure 
having a control of the area north of Crimea, because without that, Crimea may not be able to survive. I think it is something that has not been uh, taken into account, and uh, perhaps uh, it should be you know, part of the picture. Uh, OK, population. Uh, let me first expand a little bit on the deportations of 1944. Uh, they were mentioned, but I don't think that they have gotten the kind of attention that they deserve. A deportation is a word that masks or hides, you know, the en enormous dis displacement, physical displacement of people, and of course, psychological trauma uh, that the sur survivors then bear and carry over into their behavior uh, and the behavior of their descendants, for example, to this day. I don't know, to, perhaps it is uh, all known to you, but for those of you who might not know it, the deportation of the Crimean Tatars occurred on May 18th, 1944. Uh, it was, what, a quarter of a million was the population of the Tatars at the time, I believe, 250,000. The deportation took pl place in the space of one night, a quarter of a million people, with men mostly gone to fight on the front. This was mostly an operation that entailed displacing women, children, and elderly men who were put on cattle cars and sent into the Kazakh steppes in sealed trains which were not opened until they were in the Kazakh steppes. Upon the unsealing of the trains, it turned out that a very high percentage of the deportees had perished. Uh, some Tatars claimed that as many as 50%. I was teaching a course in uh, nationalities uh, issues in the 1980s, and I had a, as a guest speaker a Tatar, uh, Crimean Tatar woman, uh, an activist in the uh, movement to, uh, for repatriation to Crimea. She was sentenced uh, to uh, several years in camps in the Tashkent trials in the 1970s, Aisha Seed Muratova, who was six years old at the time, and she explained how in her family there were six children, her mother and the grandfather. As she put it, my father was on the front fighting to preserve the Soviet motherland. Uh, and the brief period of time that this family had to prepare to go, where the mother didn't know whether to fold the child, the infant, into a blanket or put shoes on the old man. I'm not trying to make this an emotional issue. I'm just trying to give you some sense of what the experience of the people actually was. The result was that Crimea became a uh, Tataran Frei. You know, it was free uh, of Tatars. And in 1954, when it became part of Ukraine, there were only the Slavs uh, actually in question. As you can see, the censuses of 59 show the percentages, the high point uh, for the Russians at 71, Ukrainians at 22. In 79, there's a decline of the Russians, a rise in the Ukrainian percentage. I guess the administration, uh, the administrative connections facilitated that because there would be elites you know, sent into Crimea from Kiev by Kievan authorities rather than directly from Moscow. But by 1989, the percentage of Russians declined to 67, and Ukrainian rises to over 25. And then enters the Tatar factor, the return of the Tatars that uh, Oksa, Oksana mentioned. And in the very first census uh, of independent Ukraine in 2001, the Tatars are already 12%, the Russians down to 58, the Ukrainians roughly around a quarter of the uh, population. This, these are the figures, these last figures are what are being mentioned today in the media as what purportedly constitutes the population of Crimea today. I think that is misleading. It is uh, probably false, and it may be, and if false, it may be even dangerous. Uh, I won't go through all the uh, mechanics of how one does this. In fact, I'm not an expert on it myself, but I've consulted with people who do demographic analysis. And because taking into consideration the age structure of the population, the passage of years, their estimate is that the uh, Crimean Tatars now form between 15 to 18% of the population. Uh, 
and in the population under the age of 20, uh, of, uh, sorry, 15, it is probably over 20%. Uh, the Ukrainians are supposedly sort of stable at around 25%, uh, and the proportion of Russians has purportedly fallen or should have fallen to about 52, 53%. That is coming very close to the 50% uh, uh, mark. Uh, and given the age structure, it would appear that uh, the future is more in the favor of the Tatar population than the Russian. One other thing that is not very often mentioned is that Crimea is a fairly large territory and it has its own regions. And in two thirds of the territory of Crimea, the northern two thirds, the Russians are actually a minority there. And the majority is Ukrainian with the Tatars actually in a kind of a belt between the Ukrainian in the steppes, the agricultural region, and the southern coastal area, which is dominated by the uh, Russians. So there is the regional factor, which is also not taken into account very often when people think of Crimea as a single uh, whole. Hmm. What do I do now? Uh, no, perhaps we'll skip this one, I think. Uh, can we go to the next one? Uh, w w what this is after the commercial uh, <laughs> is a clash between the Tatars and the Russians outside the parliament building a couple of weeks ago, with the Tatars uh, taking the pro-Kiev side and the Russians, uh, of course, the pro-Moscow side. <laughs> now, uh, can you put the hold for a second? This I'll just play a very, very s small snippet of. Uh, theoretically, Crimea in its constitution of the Autonomous Republic has three official languages, Russian, Ukrainian, because Ukrainian is the state language of the country, and Tatar. But after 21 years of this official status, Tatar was used for the first time in, uh, from the, the dais of the parliament, uh, parliament by uh, uh, Rafat Chubarov, a member of the parliament in Kiev. And uh, can we just uh, play a snippet of that? No one understands the official lang Tatar yeah, language they're asking for uh, translators. Uh, it turns yeah. out the, uh, uh, the, uh, the yeah, translator, it turns out, has not been properly trained. They have not trained translators in parliament to translate from or interpret from one official language to the other. So at the end, Mr. Chubarov says, I will dispense with the translator and I will speak to you in a language that you understand. Can we sort of move up here? Потрібно як можна швидко взяти вже штат перекладачів. Дівчина перекладає дуже добре, просто, знаєте, це синхронний переклад, це є особлива форма перекладу. Треба вже брати перекладачів, треба планувати гроші. Почекайте, не заважайте мені, будь ласка, я ж нікому не заважаю. Я хочу сказати про те, що на, на нашому телебаченні кримському ми маємо отримати ліце. Uh, this is to, uh, you know, just to, sh to show a point uh, that have, you know, that has been made by all the speakers, but I think sometimes, you know, uh, you know, a direct, you know, uh, visual uh, or uh, audio encounter, you know, can help uh, emphasize it. Uh, it shows the delicacy and the complexity uh, of the ethnic situation in, uh, in the region. And it also shows what Oksana had said, that by and large, the support and the sympathy of the Crimean Tatar population is on the side of the Ukrainians. 
Uh, can we move on to the next, the next thing, whatever it is? Glory to Ukraine, they sh shouted. A rallying call by an estimated 2,000 ethnic Tatars who had gathered outside the Crimean parliament in Simferopol. They had come to show their support for Kiev and a united Ukraine. There were scuffles with pro-Russian separatists who denounced what they called the bandits who had seized power. So you can see the uh, Crimean Tatar Russian encounter, but I want to show you yet another kind of uh, idyllic scene. Now, much has been said about uh, the, in fact, this has been used as a justification by Putin uh, about the persecution and mistreatment of the Russians in Crimea. Uh, I would be very interested in seeing the documentation of that. I have not yet myself seen it. I don't deny that it could exist. But I can tell you that what we have here is the burning of Ukrainian books in Simferopol. And not just Ukrainian, but about Ukraine. You have Historia Ukraine in Russian, but it is being burned uh, by people of that, shall we say, general appearance that you see up in the corner. <laughs> in the corner. What do I do? Can I, can, I, Lupa, can I just one comment on that? Uh, book yes. burning. It's actually even more ridiculous than this because this was actually a couple years ago. It was Natalia Vitrenko, the progressive socialist, very you know pro-Russian sort of extreme group. They even didn't, they didn't have enough Ukrainian books to burn. So they actually took some like physics books and some Russian classics and put the covers on this that said in Ukrainian. So this Historia Ukraina is actually was some like physics manual um, that they burned. So I don't know what kind of diagnosis it warrants, but it must warrant some diagnosis. I thank you yeah. for that. I didn't know that. Yeah. And it's something that is worth mentioning. This is a personal communication to me uh, that I received yesterday from a Crimean Tata friend. And uh, because we very often talk about things that sound you know, very theoretical, it is sometimes useful to remember that there are living people involved, emotions, feelings, and uh, I don't have to read it for you. You can simply uh, see the sentiments of uh, uh, at least some Crimean Tatars, of, of whom he is not uh, atypical. He is a diaspora Tatar living in Turkey, uh, actually several generations. His ancestors, uh, uh, emigrated in the uh, 19th century and he sent me this picture of demonstrations in, uh, in, in uh, Turkey by Crimean Tatars over what is going on and what let me just point out we have here Kırım Tatarlarınındır Crimea is Tatar you have the blue Tatar flag, you have the red flag of Turkey, and then you have the blue and yellow of Ukraine, and here you have Yashasun versus Ukraina, long live independent Ukraine in Turkish. Uh, and the mention of Turkey brings me to the last point, and I will end with that because it will be, I think, the subject of yet another perhaps meeting. It is a name of a country that we have not yet heard in connection with this crisis. Turkey has not been mentioned, I think, at any one of our meetings. I think that the Turks will have a lot to say about what is going on in the Black Sea region and the transfer of Crimea, the, uh, the possible transfer of Crimea to Russian sovereignty.
alters a great many things in the Black Sea, including territorial waters, including proximity to things like Costanza and the European Union's plans to use that port, but also for uh, Turkey. Turkey is today preoccupied with its own internal difficulties. They are dealing with their own kind of Yanukovych situation, corruption in government, protests, uh, funerals of uh, protesters killed. But when that ends, I think you should start paying attention to what the Turks possibly will have to say or do in this uh, region. So these are a few of my kind of Phillips, a few of my additions, footnotes but I hope that they want help to illustrate uh, some of the things that we have heard, but also maybe add something to the um, mix of questions that I hope we will have in the discussion. So thank you.